السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We always praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his entire household, all his companions, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of them and to grant every one of us the blessings. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our offspring, those to come up to the end of time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us all steadfast. Brothers and sisters in Islam, a beautiful evening in this beautiful country, the United Arab Emirates, in the beautiful city of Dubai. Beautiful venue with beautiful brothers and sisters. Every one of us is productive. That's why we are here, mashallah. If we had no productivity in us, we would still have been sleeping back at home, mashallah. And there might be other productive people listening to us online by the will of Allah. They too have some form of productivity which we need to acknowledge. So we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making us people who really can use our time wisely. This evening, you know, we are speaking of a productive Muslim. Firstly, the Muslim part of it is extremely important because that is what will guide the productivity. If a person does not have in them that Islam, then perhaps their productivity might not be of benefit to the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And perhaps it might have a totally different impact on humankind at large. So we thank Allah for being Muslim who are surrenderers to the word of Allah. And this is why it's important for me to start off by reminding myself and yourselves that the root of the productivity of a Muslim lies in his or her link with his maker or her maker. If you have no link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how do you expect that productivity of yours or the capacity, the ability that Allah has given you to be used in the right channel? How do you expect your intention for doing something or using the capacity you have, the intention behind it to be correct when we don't even have the basics, which is the link with our own maker or the ability or readiness to surrender to the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is why when we call ourselves Muslim, we should be ashamed if we do not surrender because we would be lying. We would be telling a lie. A man says, I'm a Muslim. Muslim means al-istislamu lillah, someone who surrenders to Allah and he's not productive enough to get up for Salatul Fajr. He's not productive enough to go to the masjid for Salah, for example. So can he really say, I have surrendered to Allah? Let's be honest. Can someone who's not prepared to adopt the commands of Allah at all say that I am a surrenderer to the law of Allah or to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the reason why we start off with this is there is room for improvement in my life and in yours. And by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can all do better in this regard. Every one of us, no matter how close we seem we are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can become even closer. And the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is he says to us in a hadith Qudsi, whoever comes to me, a handspan, I come to him an entire foot. Whoever comes to me walking, I come to him rushing and so on. This is because whatever you have used your energies towards, normally you achieve a result. And if you use it towards going to Allah, you will achieve such a great result that your maker will come closer to you than, you, your, than your attempt to get close to him. So what you need and I need is the attempt, the correct attempt by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we need to fulfill that. So we ask the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people who can develop this link at all times. A very important point also is the link we have with Allah is always polished up through tawbah, through repentance. We as human beings, we falter, we err, we make mistakes. We say things sometimes that we may not be proud of or we do things that we believe we could have done better. So a way to gain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that each one of us needs to constantly repent or ask his forgiveness, not just thinking that I did not commit a major sin, so I don't need to repent, but 
repenting and asking Allah forgiveness for that which we know and that which we don't know. Believe me, it increases the link with Allah and therefore it makes us utilize the energies we have been given by Allah, the capacities, the different gifts that we have been granted by Allah. It makes us utilize them in a way that they, we become of benefit to all those around us in a beautiful way. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us ease. You know, the brothers were telling me that you have to say something uh, on a lighter note because you know, the crowd is quite big. Mashallah, we have capacity crowd. Some people might still be coming and so on. So I was telling him, my brother, you know what? We are going to be speaking of something productive. So by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's going to be more serious. He says, no, no, no. You need to make sure that you raise a point that will make the people think you know, in a positive way, but getting the message across in a lighter way. You know, moments ago, he said in his own style, talking about me in his own way. The truth of the matter is to reach out to the young and the old. Sometimes we use examples that really would remain in your mind. And that example that remains in your mind, the point that is derived from it is what is of essence. So let me give you a quick example, productivity, because I started off by telling you that if a person cannot come for salah, can he then claim the link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, say he is a surrenderer, the most productive thing you could ever do is to worship Allah. The most productive thing you could ever do is to fulfill your salah on time. It is an automatic way of making you a professional leader. You have the time management close at hand, done automatically by your maker before sunrise you are up. So your laziness is out because laziness and productivity do not come together. Laziness and productivity will definitely never see eye to eye. So if a person cannot give up his laziness or hers, with the bare minimum of fulfilling salah or fulfilling the duty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what does he or she expect? So let's get to the story of a man. And it's a true story. This man comes in for Salatul Fajr after he heard a powerful talk of someone and he felt, you know what, let me get to Salah at least. So he got up early in the morning. Inshallah, I hope we all get up early morning tomorrow and we will be there for Salatul Fajr. Will we? Brilliant, inshallah. May Allah make it easy for us. Remember, don't just say inshallah. You know, sometimes when someone tells you, are you coming tomorrow? They say inshallah. Inshallah means I'll see about it. Don't do that. Say yes, inshallah. By the will of Allah, we will be there and make an effort to get there. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. A point that came to mind, this evening people gathered here from 6 o'clock, yet the talk was scheduled for 7.30 for 8. Do you know that? And this talk is not as important as your Salatul Fajr. That's what I want to raise to you. Salatul Fajr is far more valuable, but this is also important because it will motivate you by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point being raised is, can't we get to Salah five minutes before the Adhan or five minutes before the Jama'ah, before the congregational prayer? Why is it that we are rushing late, even though we might be people who go for Salah, but our productivity is on a negative because we are rushing every time. If you look back, you'll see the same people who are late, they are the late for all these salawat. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us from those. And may he not make us from those who turn around to watch who's late. You might say, how do you know? Well, subhanallah, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this young man comes up for Salatul Fajr. And the Imam is reading Surah Al-Baqarah. Now Surah Al-Baqarah, you know, uh, what is the meaning of Baqarah? The cow. And he's reading a long surah. And this young man is standing behind. And he's really, he's waiting. And he's listening. And he doesn't understand much. And this is why part of productivity is to make sure you understand the word of Allah. Part of productivity is to make sure you understand the will of Allah. Go and get it. You know, we need to be go-getters. That's a word that is used nowadays. You go and get it. You make sure you do not sit back. You need to be a go-getter if you'd like to achieve which means you talk about something, do not rest until it is done. So when we say the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, can I ask a question here? How many of us have read the meanings of the Quran in a language we understand from cover to cover? Please put up your hand. We can do better, can't we? We can do better. 
The word of your maker, the one who made you, he gave you such a beautiful life. He gave you such brilliant weather in such a lovely country. So beautiful family members and so much of wealth and so much of food and so on. And you have not yet read why he made you from his own kalam, from his own word. Surely we can do better. And by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't just nod your head. We need to say, yes, tonight I'm going to get a Quran. Whether it's the Sahih International, which is the simplest English translation you can ever read, or another book of tafsir and so on, and I'm going to start today reading one ayah, one verse, or two verses a day. If you do that, you will complete at least. That's a bare minimum. If you don't, this is what happens. You come for salah, the imam is reading some beautiful verses. What a powerful reminder where Allah is saying, has the time not come for the believers, for their hearts to soften up towards the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what was revealed from the truth. And yet we don't know what it means. So we're busy saying, when is this imam going to finish? Wallahi, it's a reality. When is this imam going to finish? But that's the word of Allah. What an insult. What an insult. It is more beautiful than my word and yours. I can never ever think that of the word of Allah. The problem is I don't know the meaning. I have not made an effort to learn the meaning. So this man comes and he's listening to Surah Al-Baqarah in Salatul Fajr and he really feels this is taking so long. And this is one of my first salawat. May Allah protect us all, grant us goodness. So after the salah, he nudges the brother next to him. He says, hey, that was long. What surah was this man? Meaning what did the Imam read? He says, this was Surah Al-Baqarah. It is known as the cow. It is the longest surah in the Quran. Wow. So this young man says, okay, okay. So now when I come for salah, I'm going to have to ask which surah is being read before I join. Look at this. Where is the productivity? If we are not productive, we lose completely. So the man arrives at Salatul Maghrib and he, the Imam starts, Alam tara kaifa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashabil fil. You know the meaning of that surah? So he asks the brother, hey, what surah is this? He says, it is the elephant. He says, whoa, if Baqarah was so big, I'm going away. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Baqarah was such a long surah, fil must be. A... So he says, brother, this is your negative thought. This is one of the shortest surahs in the Quran. So the point being raised here is how can we be productive when firstly we treat this salah which is the most important link between us and Allah with so much of negativity. And secondly, we come to the wrong conclusions based on the wrong principle we have in life. So if you have a wrong principle in life, and if you are living only for the sake of this life, you will never be able to be productive as a Muslim. You might be productive in the world, you've achieved so much, but you forgot to produce for your akhirah. This is why if you look at the, one of the best duas in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the dua informs us of the importance of this worldly life and how important it is to be a successful person who has happiness in the dunya. That can only come with, with the discipline of Islam, with the discipline of the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَمَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقَ From amongst the people there are some who ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Oh Allah grant us in this dunya, but they don't have a portion of the akhirah, of the life after death. Grant us in this world. They only make dua for this world. Ya Allah, I need the job. Ya Allah, I need the health. Ya Allah, I need the wealth. Ya Allah, I need a spouse. Ya Allah, I need this. I need a car. I need a house. I need an increase. I need a salary. I need what? I need good health and so on. All these duas are good, but what dua did you make for the life after death? You will get your promotion, you will get your wealth, you will have your car, you will have your health, you will have a spouse, you will have children. May Allah grant that to us. But did you ever think that one day you have to leave all of that? What this would mean is your expertise that Allah gave you, the ability to produce, mashallah, to be productive by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have utilized all of that to build an empire for yourself, to be able to be happy and smile and look at everything and press a remote your garage opens press a remote your car opens press a remote the car starts look at the kettle in the kitchen and it starts grrr, subhanallah 
Imagine, today you can look at something and it starts operating. I'm sure a lot of you have the phones where you look at it and it scrolls down. You look away and the video stops. You see how it's working. So all this is part of the dunya, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, from amongst them, they are those who rightly call out to Allah saying, Oh Allah, grant us the goodness in the dunya. Goodness meaning the success and the happiness and all that which comes with this beautiful world that Allah has created for us. Grant us the success in the dunya and grant us the goodness of the life after death as well. So it is a balance. And on top of that, another dua to say and save us from the punishment of the fire. So we believe. That is why we say save us from the punishment of the fire. There are people out there who do not believe in the life after death. They do not believe that there will be Jannah or Jahannam, paradise or hellfire. So they do not ask Allah for paradise, nor do they ask Allah for protection from hellfire because they don't believe. And sometimes we believe, but we forget to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, when you have a beautiful vehicle or a car or a house or anything of that nature conveyance something nice a watch or perhaps a mobile phone anything ask allah ya allah grant me jannah ya allah grant me paradise ya allah this thing here is temporary this apparatus this tool i have is your gift to me to facilitate the short life that i have in this world yes i will contribute as best as i can for the rest of humanity to be able to live a comfortable life but with the obedience of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but ya allah grant me paradise so that i can enjoy whatever is there in the paradise may allah grant it to us so this attitude needs to improve the way we treat allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should not be with laziness it should not be as though i have a choice about it in surah al-ahzab allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَارَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ It is not befitting or it is not for a believing male or female that when Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have declared something that he or she feels that I have a choice about it. A true believer believes I don't have a choice. It is Allah. He has decided this and I will do it. If my weakness makes me dilly dally, I need to make sure I repent and as soon as I can, I need to get back on track. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people who understand this. So brothers and sisters, we have productivity. Firstly, with our link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will be productive by the will of Allah. Then the link with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have a problem. What is the problem? A lot of us say, I love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When someone says Muhammad, we are quick to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yes, that is an instruction. Man salla alayya wahidatan sallallahu alayhi biha ashra. Whoever sends blessings upon me, once Allah sends blessings upon him tenfold. So if I want blessings or you want blessings, male or female, you need to send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and you receive this reward. So part of productivity is to engage in this type of Salah Ala Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But that is not the sole link with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When we say La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what we need to realize is we have declared that there is no deity, no one worthy of worship besides Allah. So I will not worship my wealth, my position, the people around me, the sticks, the stones, whatever else there is in terms of this material life and anything that is created. I will never worship it. Worship Allah alone. That is the most productive way of looking at La ilaha illallah and it is the way of looking at it. Whatever Allah says, I surrender. That's me. That's why I call myself a surrenderer, Muslim. When it comes to Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I bear witness that Muhammad, may peace be upon him, is the messenger. The one who has carried the message from the creator and brought it to me in such a way that I'm reading it. There is no doubt. This book, 
Allah says, and definitely there is no doubt in it. There is guidance for those who have taqwa, who are conscious of their maker. You want guidance from the Quran. You need to be a person who's conscious of your maker. You are not conscious of your maker. You will not be able to be productive with your link with the Quran. Nor will you be able to benefit. And a person who does not want to benefit from the Quran, there is something wrong with their level of taqwa and the consciousness of Allah. So if, for example, we take a look at the Quran, we read it and it, we recite it so much, it does not affect us. There is something wrong with our belief in Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the word of Allah. Today, people can cheaply, very cheaply, become so heavily affected by a small word which is uttered by a person of the opposite sex whom they are in love with who doesn't even know them, for example, sometimes. And they go crazy. Look at how people go crazy with the pop stars and so on across the globe. Whereas, when it comes to the word of Allah, we are not even one-tenth as crazy. Not one-tenth as crazy. It doesn't affect us. When Allah says, you want success, you need to believe and do good deeds. That's how you will achieve success. And we think otherwise. We think no, man. But when someone else, one of the people of the globe, who has seen a little bit of glamour and glitter, when we look at them and we see the type of life they are living, we, they become our icons and our role models. That is one of the most destructive things because their lives in most cases are full of depression and full of lack of that happiness and contentment. You know, I've had the opportunity to meet with a few film stars. And if you look at them in real life, they will confess to you that my life is a mess. A mess. And yet people want to dress like them. They want to be like them. So what will happen? As a result of all that, your life also becomes a mess. Allahu Akbar. Why? Because you are following someone whose example has led to their real life being a mess. What they do on the screen is something else. What happens in real life, they are not productive. They have perhaps produced, but because they don't have the deen, that production is not, as I said, focused upon the contentment of the dunya and the akhirah. So therefore, they cannot be the perfect example. But Allah says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Indeed, we have a shining example to emulate in that of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the person of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a beautiful example, the way he did business, the way he treated his spouse, his family members, the people, the Muslims, the non-Muslims, how forgiving he was, how kind he was, his beautiful words, how he spoke, how he walked, how he talked. Every single thing is at the peak of excellence. If only we are productive enough to go through the seerah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How many of us, and another question and I'd like to see by a show of hands inshallah. How many of us have read a detailed biography of the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from cover to cover? Yes, put up your hand. We can do better by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can do better. My brothers and sisters, to say we can do better is an acknowledgement of what we've done, but an encouragement to say, let us produce, let us have better results by the will of Allah. Why do we just say Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But what about his life? I don't know. What about his example? I don't know. You are the one who's screaming at home to your spouse. You are never there for your children. How can you say, I believe in Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa only by tongue, but his example means nothing to you. Yet he was the most productive, so productive he was that without internet, without even a microphone, the whole world changed. Subhanallah. That's how productive he was. By the will of Allah, obviously, the help is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was a Nabi, the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the point being raised is of utmost importance that that shining example, we have not yet seen it yet. The most successful human being to exist was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without a doubt. You know, people say, oh, this guy's got 1.5 million followers on Facebook. Oh, that guy's got 10 million followers. Big deal. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has got two and a half billion likes. How's that? Did he have internet? No. Allahu Akbar. Did he have a loud hailer? No. So what happened? That was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him success. But our problem is we have not yet read through the pages of how that success was achieved. That's the problem. And it's not enough to just read through the pages. But my genuineness with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam should make me so productive that 
I become an asset to everyone around me. I touch them with something. Just the mere fact that I've been in their presence for a few minutes, I need to touch them. How many of you, when you are with someone and you pass them or you see them once in your life and the way your interaction has been, you've left a mark. Well, if we were proper Muslims, perhaps we would have left that mark. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. We would be more conscious of leaving a mark. And you cannot leave a good mark if the only marks you have in your own life are not good. So if I want to leave a good mark, good impression, it's not just an impression to impress, no. But what we mean is a good example, something worth remembering. People look at Islam today and they have this animosity against Islam. They don't understand, they don't realize. And sometimes it's our own doing. Because the way we behave, you know, you see a non-Muslim and you just, that's it, walk the other way. No. They are sometimes so productive, but they lack the deen. If they had the deen in them, they would have been productive in both ways and been ultimately successful. What we can do is the minimum, take a page from their lives to see the productivity in their lives, how they achieved top positions, how they've achieved so much success in terms of the dunya, take a page from it. Believe me, it comes with discipline. If you are not disciplined or focused and you do not have a goal and an objective, you cannot be productive. Our objective is paradise. But at the same time, we'd like to live a life where we can live comfortably. And together with that, we can prepare for the generations to come to be good members of the ummah. That's the preparation. The difficulty is with us. We tend to forget what our objective is. So the objective becomes very watered down sometimes. Or deep down at the back of our minds, we know that, okay, I'm a Muslim, I need Jannah. But right now, I need a million dinars. That's a minor issue. To be honest with you, if you had Jannah without the million dinars, you are more successful than if you had two million dinars without the Jannah. Do you understand? So the balance we're talking about. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if we take a look at his entire life and we learn it and we make it our business to consider him the Nabi of Allah in the true sense where when he has said something, we adopt, we understand, we relate. Then inshallah, we will become the best of people and we will be able inshallah to produce. We will be able to be people who can by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala achieve success in the dunya as well as in the akhirah. My brothers and sisters, we are so fortunate that we have been granted the chance to enjoy the dunya. Imagine if Allah told us that, look, you believe in me, I made you. You're not allowed to wear these clothings and, and have anything else to do with luxury. You just need to be in prayer for your whole life. Imagine if that was a ruling and we had to stand in salah the whole day and the whole night. What would happen? So Allah says, no, discipline is brought about through obeying the command of Allah because discipline is the prime component of achievement. Anyone in this world who has achieved, I'm talking of worldly achievement, they can never have done so without discipline. They need to be strict. They need to be following rules and regulations. You tell me, doesn't Islam have the most rules and regulations? Sometimes people say Islam is tough. The truth is it's not tough. It's people who are not prepared to be disciplined. They just want to do as they please. So if we do as we please, the productivity will not be holistic. It might be, you know, just a small department of achievement. That's all. Small portion of it. But the minute we have the entire component, we have good achievement by the will of Allah. Like we say, discipline. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us in a way that we need to be productive, even with our family members. Imagine we spoke about Allah, we spoke about Rasulullah and then we have the family members. How do we treat them? How do we touch their lives? How do we invest in them? When we have children, children are an investment for our dunya and the akhirah. Amazing, you know, one day I was sitting with a man and he told me, we got chatting, non-Muslim. And we got chatting and we're talking about all sorts of things and so on. And then he tells me, so uh, how many children do you have? I told him, I have seven. He said, what, seven? Seven kids. Are you crazy? How are you going to afford that? That's a question because it's looked at from a different angle altogether. Sometimes 
People who do not have Iman look at children as an expense. How am I going to afford it? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained this in the Quran in a beautiful way. But I said, you know what? If I said, why is it considered an expense? He said, how are you going to pay fees? I said, that's all temporary. It's just for a few years. After that, you know what happens? Each one of them will have a salary of 100,000 and I'm going to be a rich man. I've got more kids than yours. So I'll be having 700,000 before you know it. And if your kids say, for example, one is still searching for a job. Oh, I don't know what's going to happen. So anyway, I just made it sound that way. But the point I was trying to get across is for us, it's a huge investment. Not only for the dunya, but more so for the akhirah. Tazawwaju al-waduda al-walud. Fa'inni mubahim bikum al-umam yawm al-qiyamah. It's something of the Prophet ﷺ's teachings to 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 want more children or as many as you can bring up properly. You know, obviously there there are teachings of Islam in this regard which are detailed, which I'm not going to go into because it's not part of the topic, but. We need to bring up our children with a lot of discipline and with goodness, with character. This afternoon we spoke, or should I say this morning, we had a parental workshop here. And mashallah, we managed to meet with quite a few parents and we discussed this topic at length. But by the will of Allah, if we know that every child that reads Salah because of our encouragement, even after we die, we will be receiving a reward for that particular child's productivity. Imagine. Your child, you've given them such an upbringing that they make dua, they pray for you after you've died. The hadith says, إِذَا مَا تَبْنُ آدَمَ انْقَطَ عَنْهُ عَمَلُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثِ If a person, a human being dies, all his deeds are cut off from him besides three things. What are these three things? One is knowledge that he may have disseminated. Two is a charitable deed that is a continued charity that he may have given somehow benefiting others. This is productivity. To learn is productivity, but more productive than learning is to put into practice and disseminate. That's why in Islam, it's not only ilm, but it's ilmun wa amal wa da'wah. You need to learn, you need to put into practice, and you need to call others towards it. Convey the message. Allahu Akbar, I always tell the sisters, you know, when you go to a home and you find, mashallah, this cake was beautiful. So, you know, sometimes a man might come back and he might say, Hey, I went to this house of my friend and you know there was a lovely cake so uh, let's not get into negatives but let's be positive each other so uh, lovely cake so the wife says okay she messages the, 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 the sister there and says my husband says the cake was very nice what is the recipe a lot of women will say it's my secret it's a secret where is productivity you might die tomorrow morning your cake is gone with you Allahu Akbar You'd rather write your name on it and say, this is a beautiful cake. I tried 20 different cakes. This thing came out. Here's the ingredient and so on. You bake it in the sun, not in the oven. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> and then if you had died, people will make the cake later. They'll remember you. But imagine that issue that's being dealt with is not a cake, but it is something developing your link with Allah. When you die, they won't only remember you. You get a reward for it, whatever they do. And when they make a dua for you, you get a reward for it. So these type of things are what will benefit. And one of the points I was raising, and that's why I raised the hadith, is a child who prays for you after you've died. How will that child pray for you when you have not been of any positive impact upon your own children? Father, you were never at home. Where were you? I was at work all day, every day. So my child was brought up by whom? I don't even know. You know, we say to bring up is different from to grow like wild grass. You know, if you put water on soil that is fertile, it will grow anything, weeds or whatever. But if you sow seeds and then put water, you can have a fruit tree. You can have something else. So water can be beneficial if only you've sown the seeds. The same applies. You have children, mashallah. To be able to make them productive in the right sense, you need to engage in their lives. That is productivity. If I do not take part in the lives of my children, I'm not a productive Muslim. Because Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Allahu Akbar, O oh, you who believe, save yourselves and your family members from the fire. That's a Muslim. So if I understand this and I believe it and I work towards it, I'm so productive that the day I die, not only will I be saved, but, but my children will have direction by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah grant us goodness.
Then we have the workplace. All of us, majority of us, we work. Some of us are self-employed, some of us are employed by others. Some might be looking for jobs. May Allah make it easy for you to find a good job. I mean, you see, the Amin was soft, meaning a lot of us have jobs. Okay, Alhamdulillah. So the reality is, at the workplace, are you a dedicated Muslim? You know, we have doctors, lawyers, accountants, and so many people. One is to have a doctor who is a Muslim. And the other is to have a Muslim doctor. There is a difference between the two. Why? One, he is conscious of his Islam. And he is conscious of leaving that Islam in the hearts of everyone he interacts with or she interacts with. Conscious of it. And the other is a professional who is trying to hide the fact that they are Muslim. But they are Muslim. Allahu Akbar. Big difference between the two. You want to be a productive Muslim, do not shy away from being Islamic. Your name is Abdul Aziz, say it is Abdul Aziz. Do not say it is Zizi. <laughs> it's a reality. May Allah protect us. That's just one example. There are so many different examples. If you are proud of your Islamic identity, automatically you are part of being a productive Muslim. You've already started the stage. Why? Because all of us have a capacity. Every one of us has a gift from Allah. Some have recognized their gifts and some haven't. All of us have the capacity to contribute and we are contributing. Every one of us, kullukum ra' wa kullukum mas'ulun Every one of you is a shepherd and each one of you is responsible for his or her flock. So we've all been given some form of leadership, some form of gift from Allah. We have energies, we have capacities. Why do we need to use those capacities without confirming our Islam and without confirming the fact that we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we are Muslim? You are going to work anyway, whether you're a Muslim, whether you portray you're a Muslim or not, you're still going to work. If you would like to develop your link with Allah, just make sure that they know you're a good Muslim. Amazing. Amazing. And being a good Muslim does not mean you pick a fight with people. It does not mean that you need to be harsh. No, that in fact is a warped interpretation of Islam. We are supposed to reach out to people. Like we say, every non-Muslim is a potential Muslim. Potential Muslim. May Allah grant us the ability to touch the hearts in a way that when he guides them, he makes us a means to at least have touched them. Your character, if you are honest and upright at your workplace, you don't flirt as the others flirt. And people know this man is so good. He's such a professional. He is brilliant in every way. And you know what? He's upright. No flirting, no bad, you know, no bad habits and so on. Such a good person. The non-Muslims will be making dua to say, Allah, give us a husband like this. They'll be making dua in their own way. They will be praying in their own way to say, we want a brilliant husband. I know of people who will say that we want an upright Muslim as a husband and they're not Muslim. I actually have a few examples. People have told me that. And you say, why? Because they don't drink, they don't have bad habits. And I say, oh, Alhamdulillah, at least you've seen the right side of us. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. May Allah grant us goodness. So people gauge or judge Islam based on us. People judge Islam based on us. And we need not shy away from Islam and its teachings because that's what people need. A lot of the times people later on in life will tell you, you know what, I appreciate the fact that you were a little bit hard or I appreciate the fact that you were a little bit blunt because I've learned a lesson from it. We've saved hundreds or thousands by the will of Allah. Why? Because we were not shy of our Islamic identity. To be shy of your Islamic identity reduces your productivity. You cannot claim to be a productive Muslim and you will not be able to be a truly productive Muslim if you shy away from that Muslim part of the term productive Muslim. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So the workplace, all of us, let's better our attitude. Let's become disciplined. You are on time. Why? As a Muslim, it should be so easy for you to come. If your work kicks off at 8, 5 to 8, the Muslims are there. Why? Because you read your salah. I can be disciplined for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by never missing a single salah five times a day. Work, I only have to go there once a day. Why can't I arrive on time at least? But today they tell you, you know what? He's a Muslim or oh, eight o'clock. He'll probably come by about nine. He might be here. Is that the attitude? I hope not in this country, but in some places that is the attitude. They tell you this is 
Indian mean time. You say, I've never heard of that. What does that mean? That means the time is mean. What does that mean? That means it's very bad. You know, mean means mean, you know. So they say that means bad timing. If they tell you 8 o'clock, perhaps at 9 they'll phone you and say, I'm running a bit late, brother. Come on, man. Come on. Is that a product of Muslim? If you give someone a word, be there in advance. If you're going to be delayed, well before the timing, inform them, listen, we will be slightly delayed by the will of Allah. Do you know I was told this evening's talk will start off at 8? We started at 5 to 8. That's Emirates time, mashallah. When Emirates lands, they tell you we are five minutes ahead of schedule. Well, that's what we did today. By the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reason I say this, that productivity reaches so far and it really impacts the people's lives that we don't realize these small pieces of discipline that we achieve through spirituality should help us to become professional. When you do something, do it properly. This evening, mashallah, look at this venue as packed as it is. But look at the facility. Look at how beautifully it was done with what excellence considering the place the time and whatever other facilities we've had to make use of the organizers have done a splendid job subhanallah may allah bless them they are productive muslims by the will of allah if it wasn't for that productivity i think people across the globe would not be listening to us now about 15 minutes before we started already the brother was telling me there are 500 people watching from overseas subhanallah right now i don't even know what if we were not productive Muslims and did not think of that, what would happen? We would not be able to touch the maximum. Yet, the, the opportunity is one. Your opportunity is now. I don't know if I'm going to get another opportunity to speak to you. So I better reach out to as many as possible. But the organizers have thought of this. This might be, you know, a function that might touch someone somewhere, somehow. Let's get to as many people as possible. That is productivity. This forward thinking. By the will of Allah, this is part of our work. Then we have productivity. The house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What have you contributed towards the masjid in your area? The minimum contribution is to attend for salah. Did you know that? The minimum contribution, which is actually not a contribution, but it is a gift for you. Call it a contribution today. Is for you to attend. The house of Allah calls you. Look, mashallah, as I'm sit sitting here, as I'm standing, I can see so many of these minaras, ma'adin, so many of them here. Amazing how some of us never go there, except if it's a Jum'ah. What's the productivity? What did you give the masjid of your area? It's the house of Allah. When you get into your grave, your link with the house of Allah is going to help you because the hadith says, Rajulun qalbuhu mu'allakum bil masajid. A person whose heart is always hanging in the masjid, he always wants to go back to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, always concerned about his prayer, always concerned about the timing of the prayer and so on. That person will have a special shade on the day of judgment. Amazing. This is productivity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. When there is a charitable cause, how many of us can reach out meaningfully? Meaningfully. To be productive does not just mean to give a charity. Look where you are giving it. Who are you giving it to? Are they responsible people? Will they fulfill it? Will they get it to where it is supposed to get to? And so on. So many things are to be considered. That is part of productivity. If I've got wealth, it's easy for me to give. But it's not easy for me to give the right people. It's not easy for me to reach the right people sometimes. It will be a little bit more of an effort to find the right people and give it to them. That is part of productivity, to make the effort to try your best. Make the effort to try and get it to the right people at the right time. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goodness. And this is why we say, your choice of friends and the people you mix with plays such a big role in how productive you are going to be. Some people get together, the only thing they like is to watch. What are you watching? Cricket. What else? Football. What else? The movies. What else? Well, this thing and that thing, golf, golf, subhanAllah, has become a big thing. So if that is the only thing you are doing, then believe me, you need, your company needs a little bit of adjustment because life is not all about golf. You know, when the angel asks you uh, questions, you can't say, oh, I played 18 holes off par. I played 18 holes off par. That's not going to help. That was just part of your amusement in the dunya. We're not saying it's wrong, for example, to have a game of golf, but... To give it preference over your deen is definitely wrong. 
to forget about the fact that you might die on the golf course and we've had people who have, who, whom that has happened to, then what will happen? Nobody's going to say he used to use the ping club. You know the club? Ping, P-I-N-G. Wow, nice club used by people, top people. Nobody's going to ask you that. So we need to direct a little bit. Whilst we are amusing ourselves in the dunya, life is not all about entertainment alone. No. The most or the people who are most at loss as Muslimin are those who think life is all about partying. Come Friday night, we're out in the party. Come Friday night, we go out every Friday. What do we do? We party until the early morning when the people are going for Fajr. And you know what we are doing? We're heading in the other direction. People are going for Fajr and we're going back to bed whilst the prayer is being called towards and we are heading in another direction. If that is our life and we've reduced it to partying and enjoying every weekend, where is the productivity? We've lost focus. Sometimes the new generation gets so involved in movies and so involved in entertainment that they feel without thinking their life is all about entertainment, partying, whole day. Everything is about a party at this house and that house and next week we're going to meet at this house. Where are the halakat? Where is something that you've done for your deen? Why don't you choose some weekends to come out to a talk like this as a family, for example, or go and mobilize, go and get people, get someone to talk to you. Not everyone is going to be able to talk to you on a certain level, but at least share what you have. Get some recitation of Quran, get a little teacher, get someone to explain to you one verse of the Quran. It doesn't need to be so long because nowadays what we've noticed when you prolong something to do with spirituality and religion, people become a little bit put off. So if I were to talk to you for one hour, perhaps you would listen. The minute I stretch it to the next hour, we'll start finding people stretching their hands. You know, we'll find people yawning and they do it purposely. You know, in one lecture, I told the brothers and the sisters that I will end the talk when I see the first person yawning. So immediately I said, please don't yawn intentionally. <laughs> but mashallah, I didn't find any of that yawning. But I thought to myself, if someone wants to stop me, they just got to go, ah, you know, and it's over. I'll say, thank you. He's yawning. I'm gone. But productivity is that we don't bore people with things. Don't make them bored. Say something that is relevant. Say something that will benefit them. Keep them on their toes. You know, this is why the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, ma qalla wa kafa khayrun mimma kathura wa alha. That which is short to the point is better than that which is much more and it distracts you. So if you go home and someone asks you, how was the talk? You say, powerful. But how was it? Powerful. What did he say? Power packed. <laughs> so what's happening? Ah, power, mashallah. Productive Muslim. That's all you remember. Productive Muslim. The most productive thing was the word powerful. Allahu Akbar. If that's the case, we achieve nothing. So the best thing to do is speak short. Say something good. The reason I say this is we sometimes cause people to lose productivity because we bore them when they had a good intention to come out to do something and we just kept them sitting, kept them that way. You, when we do not utilize the energies of the youth, we bore them into lack of productivity. We actually boot them out into oblivion. The youth have a lot of energy. Use them for something. Mobilize them. Get them used in something constructive because if not, they will start partying because for them, that's the past time. They have nothing better to do. Why? Nobody allowed them to do something. Let them get together. Let them organize perhaps some food for an orphanage, perhaps a little bit of old clothes to send somewhere to a country or maybe a little bit of aid to send to someone who's struggling across the globe. Let them mobilize it and do it on their own in a beautiful way. Play a little role in their lives. These are the youngsters, the, perhaps the children and those who are growing up. So from that young age, we've already taught them productivity. Use your time wisely. The Prophet says two gifts of Allah. Many people are deceived regarding them. What are these two gifts? Your health. Whilst you have it, be productive, use it. There will come a day when you won't have it. That is there. So whilst you can fulfill your salah, whilst you can use that energy to reach out to as many people as you can in the most positive way. The minute we don't Remember, or the minute we become oblivious of the fact that the health is a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what will happen is we lose productivity. The same applies to your time, your free time. If you're not going to utilize it, believe me, I know of some people who are so productive that every minute they get, they are doing something to reach out to as many as they can. First, you reach out to yourself. You reach out in every way 
to your own development. You know, we say seek knowledge, develop your qualities. You know, with evil qualities, you can never reach out to others. So develop your own qualities first. If you have jealousy, hatred, malice, all these dirty qualities, love of sin, the love of the world to the degree that you compromise your link with Allah just to achieve a little bit, all that we will never be able to be productive towards others. But once we have developed ourselves, we can reach out to many more. I was saying I know of people who every moment they have, they reach out to others. They're thinking of what to do. And I know of some others, their best friend is the duvet. The duvet. As soon as they get a free moment, they are sleeping. Why? Oh, the weather is like this. This is like that. The duvet, you know. When I was living in Saudi Arabia, there was a mattress called Sleep High. Sleep High, that was a brand. So we're driving from Jidda to Makkah and suddenly I saw a horse and I saw it saying Sleep High and the horse is, you know, like this. And I was new at the time and I'm looking, I said, I wonder what this is, Sleep High. I mean, they're talking of weed or something. I, I, I don't know, Sleep High. What's this all about? So I'm thinking of it and then I asked the driver, I said, you Sleep High, what's this? He says, no, that's just a... Uh, a mattress. I said, oh, subhanallah. Imagine, sleep high. When I got to know some of my colleagues and friends, some of them were such that they really used to sleep high. You know, the level of sleep was very high. So from 24 hours, when we sleep seven, eight hours, oh, some people would sleep 12 hours. They say, that's what is meant by sleep high. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who know how to rest. Rest is important, but too much of it, we lose productivity. We become addicted to sleep because we're lazy. And laziness overtakes us. So it's important by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us really to fight our own selves and then to be able to reach out to as many people as possible. Another very, very important point of productivity. Your country. Your nation. How did you reach out to your nation? Ask yourself the question. We said, how did you reach out to the masjid? How did you reach out to your community? You know, when there are community uh, gatherings, some people will say, oh, these expats are getting together. The Sri Lankan expats are getting together. The Indian expats are getting together. The Pakistani expats are getting together. The Filipino expats are getting together. The, these expats are getting together. And by default, a lot of us will say, waste of time. Don't even bother going. But you don't realize you need to go and make a positive change if you want something good to happen. The platform is already there. All you need to do is take a part, play a role. Because a leader who is productive will try to use a platform that is already there to make it productive because it is more difficult to create a whole new platform. Understand that. So if I have a function, for example, I will go. There might be one or two things I might not like. There might be a little bit of a waste of time, but I will make sure the input that I have made is such that it can change the whole outlook of that entire gathering and the purpose of it inshallah can become much more meaningful by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is productivity to be able to change things to look at your community what did you present your own community not only your own nationality but even the community you live in here one of the most diverse countries in the whole world with more than 200 nationalities brilliant the UAE what a gift of Allah what did you learn from others? Have you mixed with people from different cultures and learned the goodness that they have? Every culture has a lot of goodness, rich in goodness. Take the good. That which contradicts your deen, you can perhaps excuse it, but take the good. And this is why productivity entails that we make use of the gift of each individual that is unique to them in a way that they can be utilized for the holistic benefit of everyone. Someone is an expert for example, in cooking, well, make them the cook. Someone is an expert, for example, in, say, for example, he's an IT specialist. Well, make use of him in the community as well. And not such that you abuse the man or the woman, the brother or the sister, but rather you use them in a beautiful way. They feel like they are of help. And at the same time, we have achieved and benefited through their expertise by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's important also for us to have outreach programs. If you'd like to be productive, you need to reach out to the poor. You need to reach out to the orphans. You need to go visiting. You know, visiting our, the sickly is something very productive. They have a heart at the time that has a condition that is softer than the normal times when they were healthy. 
So whatever you say at that point, the good words you utter have a bigger impact on a person who is not so healthy anymore or who has gone through a health matter. Imagine a lot of us might have been in hospital for a few days. Allah grant us all good health. I mean, may Allah grant cure to those who are sick and ill. I mean, when we were in hospital, you know how boring it becomes? It's one of the most boring environments because you just have to sit and wait. Some people, they are workaholics, they cannot rest. So they will do something and so on, no matter what. And then comes the nurse and the sister. No, you have to rest, you have to rest. Imagine if someone comes, short visit, power pack, telling you words that motivated you, shook you up, gave you a lot of hope and a lot of courage, and they went away. You're smiling. You're smiling for half an hour. You're thinking of it in the evening. You have so much hope. You feel half better because you know there are people out there who care for you. That's productivity. This is why the hadith of Muhammad وسلم, gives so much importance to visiting the sickly. Go and visit the elderly. You'll get a page of wisdom from them. And remember when we visit, don't waste time. Some of you might have heard me saying in one of my talks when I was young, I visited one home with my mom. When I was quite young, I went with my mother to one of her friend's house, houses. And I remember distinctly on the door there was a sticker. And the sticker says, we are happy at your arrival, but we will be even happier when you depart. <laughs> I looked at it and I said, whoa, this is telling us not to waste time. So I was telling my mother, Ma, let's go, you know, let's go. She says, what are you such a big rush for? I said, I'll tell you later. When I went home, I told her mom, there was a sticker on the door. Now that was my mistake. That sticker was just a joke, I think. But I told my mother, this was the sticker. It says, we are happy upon your arrival, but we will be even happier when you depart. My mother picked up the phone, phoned a friend. Hey, why didn't you tell me? Why did you have to just stick a sticker? Anyway, they sorted out that problem which I had created by relating it. But the truth is, the point we are learning is when you visit people, have a time limit. You don't go and sit. Today we have technology. Message them. Make sure they are comfortable with your visit. Because when a person is not comfortable with your visit, it is the most destructive visit you would ever have. No productivity in it. They are sitting there making dua, Ya Allah, make them go. Ya Allah, make them go. Oh, these people arrived, you know. It's like when you knock on the door and someone comes out and they say, my dad told me to tell you that he's not here. Then you know that this means I'm not supposed to have been here at all. Lack of productivity. We've got technology, phone them. I'd like to come. Is it convenient for me to visit you? They'll tell you, no, perhaps come tomorrow, come the next day. I'm not going to manage. Okay, so let's make it for next week. Okay, fine, no problem. You've agreed. And when we visit, you don't sit whole day that people want to sleep and you're still sitting there. No, go away. I would prefer to have a short visit in a way that they tell you, we want you to come back. And they really mean it. Then for them to say, oh, we can't wait for you to come back. But they're meaning, get out. Allahu Akbar. We don't want that. So I'd rather ha have a short visit than to have a long one where they're sick and tired of me. The next time they see me from the intercom, from the video at the intercom, oh, this man, don't even answer the gate. Leave it. Everyone keep quiet. This attitude of hypocrisy is created because of our lack of productivity. We didn't think. So to think, to be courteous, to be polite, to be considerate. These are all qualities that will enhance the productivity of a person. More so if you're a Muslim. We are taught consideration when you're going to the masjid. Make sure you're looking okay. Make sure you're smelling good so that you do not become a means of destruction for the man next to you reading salah. The hadith speaks of a person who has eaten onions or garlic to wash their mouth thoroughly before they get to the masjid. Why? Because you don't want to become a person who results or who has resulted in the, the loss of productivity that a young man next to you had and he comes and says, you know, you're standing in salah and you're reading surat al and amta alayhim and your mouth is smelling so bad the man next to you is trying. <laughs> and you don't know what's happening but your mouth. The hadith tells you, wash your mouth. Imagine what type of consideration. Do you think Muhammad sallallahu would tell us something that was not productive? Never. So if he told us that, it shows consideration for other people. Be considerate. Look at their convenience. Look at what might hurt them, what might harm them. And so on. When we drive, we can be beautiful people who drive according to the laws. We don't have to be people who are hooligans, who give the wrong impression. Leave your soul interaction with a person on the road that you've had as the worst ever. 
I don't know about this country. I think from what I noticed, from what I gather, the laws are fulfilled quite well uh, on the road, I hope. I, that's what I noticed. But in other countries, subhanallah, you find a man darting, you know, from one end to the other. You look carefully and he looks like a Muslim. Oh no, man. It has happened. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us all and to grant us goodness. So we need, inshallah, to make sure that we have given as much as we can to society, to community, to our own people, to the various categories. Reach out to those who are oppressed as well. Support the oppressed. Don't run away from them because they need your help. If they don't get your help the day you need help, there will be none. Or if you were to reach out to them the day you need someone to reach out to you, there will be thousands, thousands of people because they know this man, amazing. He used to reach out to everyone. He was a good man. Say good words. That's productive. Do you know every word you utter is an investment, opportunity. You either allow that investment to succeed or to flop. So you can choose your words in order to better the returns. Listen carefully. You can choose your words to better the returns. You know, in this country, we talk business, big deal, mashallah. Everything is number one. So we thank Allah for that. The same applies. Let your speech be number one. May Allah correct us. I mean, we are human beings. Sometimes we say things, you know, we are a little bit hard sometimes, but we need reminders. Before you speak, tell yourself, what I'm about to say will have a fruit. What I'm about to say will have a fruit. Will that fruit be a good fruit or a bad fruit? I'd like it to be something that will be beneficial, benefit others. So even in your own family, speak with respect, good words. That is so productive because your child will speak beautifully just because they heard you speak. You know, when we speak slang, the children speak slang as well. Someone might say, well, what's the problem? The problem is productivity is reduced due to colloquialness, due to getting involved in slang. You know, when we are not professional, sometimes we discourage people from mixing with us, from coming to us, from wanting to have anything to do with us. So productivity is cut. But if you speak well in the home, to the people, everywhere, you are very, very uh, well-spoken, well-presented and so on. That is part of productivity. You feel good and automatically you present a picture. The others who mix with you, they feel good automatically. You're always smiling. A smile is so productive that it has been made an act of charity. You know, charitable deed means you're reaching out to people who need it. That's the meaning of the term charity. You're being charitable. So I don't realize that I need people to smile at me. But when I smile and I see others lighting up and smiling and I feel good, then I realize the impact of it on my own emotion and my own psychological condition at that particular time. Amazing. So you smile. You have a good look about yourself in the sense that give people a nice look, you know, to look someone in the eye when you're greeting them. It's part of the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa You greet them properly. You know, some people half-hearted, they give you two fingers. It's like a gun. I, I shot you at the top and I shot you at the bottom. That's not how you're supposed to greet someone. You greet them for whole hand, mashallah, and you shake their hand properly. Assalamu alaikum, how are you my brother? Good, good things, mashallah. Don't ever go into details that make them feel like you're putting them in the corner and it embarrasses them. No, don't do that. You know, I have a habit. I don't like to ask people, brother, where are you working? What's your salary? Uh, how did you get the job? Is, uh, when was your last, uh, you know, promotion? It's none of your business, my brother. When you start asking people too many questions and you start interfering in their lives, they feel uncomfortable. And what will happen? You have already cut a link with them from their hearts. They don't want to mix with you. Why? You ask too many questions. It happens with the brothers nowadays more than the sisters. There was a time a few years ago when they say that was a quality of the women. Now, no, 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 no. That's a quality of all of us. We have a habit. Sometimes we ask unnecessary questions. Brother, I had a man who told me, how much do you weigh? And I said, hey, come on, relax, man. How much do I weigh? What's the big deal? He says, no, you're a sheikh. A lot of the sheikhs are big. You know, I said, so what? You know, how much do I weigh? 
Why are you asking me the question? So if people ask you that which is irrelevant, you are distancing yourself from them and them from yourself. When you greet someone, Assalamu Alaikum, how are you my brother? How's the family? What's going on? Mashallah, you might want to say one or two nice things and that's it. You smiled at them and you went away. You've left an impact. Next time they meet you, they will greet you, my brother, how are you? But when you ask questions, they see you another time from a distance and they've gone through the other door. Why? Because, hey, that man, watch out. When he talks, oh, it's the, you won't hear the end of it. He's going to involve in your life negatively. So my brothers and sisters, we've spoken quite a bit. This topic we have, the productive Muslim, is such a vast topic that we've only touched on snippets of it. Everyone who talks of, of it will be able to talk about different aspects of it. Each one of us will have learned from our own experiences and we will be able to share our own examples. We will be able to share our own experiences. And this is why I invite you to go to Google and to search for productive Muslim and to go and find Abu Productive. There is a man known as Abu Productive or there is a Twitter page known as Abu Productive, a Facebook page as well, Abu Productive. Go and have a peep. Perhaps you might want to learn a thing or two from there. You will be able to benefit because so many people have said so many things about this topic. It's wrong for me to say, you know what? This is it. What have I left you with? Well, I've told you where to go, inshallah, by the will of Allah. It's not me, but it's someone who's doing productive work. We have to support it. So to support work that is productive is also part of pro being productive as a Muslim. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every single one of us. May Allah grant us goodness. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdih. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Jazakallah khair. Sheikh Mufti Ismail Menk on that very inspirational and a great reminder, I think, for us Muslims who have got so much potential. And now, inshallah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He makes us more productive um, in whatever professions we are best at. Also, we are now getting into a more interesting, engaging. Uh, here's an opportunity for us to pose questions to Sheikh Mufti Menk, inshallah. Um, but I would request uh, there are certain guidelines we have to follow so that we make the best use of the time available here with us. To start with, we've got two mics placed here, uh, one at the brother's side and one for the sisters. We will take one question after the other. The questioner should announce their name and their profession. And this is for the brothers. The sisters need not say their name, but we would like to know your profession so that the speaker can put forward the answer appropriately. All questions are meant to be on the topic only. And as an MC, I have the authority to stop any questions that are without, outside the topic. The topic, again, for a reminder, is productive Muslim. So try and make sure that your questions are on the topic. We're seeing huge crowds. Uh, you know, obviously here, alhamdulillah, this place is all filled up. We have the inside facility all filled up. But alhamdulillah, we also have about a thousand people online, alhamdulillah, from various parts of the world who have joined us online through the online streaming. We're trying to, inshallah, see if we could justify their presence as well. As much as we have people in the UAE would like to benefit from the presence of uh, Sheikh Mufti Menk here with us, but we, inshallah, we'll also give about a few questions that can be possible to be answered for the people who are online with us, inshallah. We start with the question first from the brothers. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. I'm Muhammad Sabil. I'm a medical doctor. I just want to know that uh, how can a Muslim become productive in a place where he works? Okay, please. At the workplace. I've been given a duty here. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. The question is about being productive in the workplace. Uh, I have already spoken about productivity in the workplace uh, from a specific angle, but if we'd like to look at it holistically, in a simple answer is ask yourself every time that you are in that workplace, how have I reached out to all those who I, whom I've interacted with, bearing in mind that the prime thing that you are supposed to be conscious of as a Muslim is your Islam. So how have I reached out? Do they now know that my religion is a brilliant religion? Do I fulfill my job in such a way that they realize that I am an asset to my workplace? 
They need me here. And at the same time, I have helped everyone here in whatever way I can. The minimum is no harm has reached them from me. That also is part of productivity. If, if you've harmed people, it's negative productivity, which means you're actually going the other way around. So it's very important for us to keep on asking ourselves the question and answer it yourself. How best have I made use of whatever Allah has given me to reach out to as many people as possible and to do the best. For example, sometimes not only reaching out to those whom you are working with, but the work, the nature of the work you have might be to excel in it and to produce something that can benefit mankind. So there are some doctors, for example, who have come up with certain types of maybe medication, certain types of discoveries, achievements, and so on. That also is a very, very great gift that Allah has bestowed upon those which they need to be able to reach out to the rest with. So to work in the best way possible is part and parcel of being productive. And I end with a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ has told us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves from his worshiper that when he does something, he does it properly. So to do things properly and professionally is part of productivity and is part of your duty as a Muslim. Jazakumullahu khaira. We'll take the next question from the sisters. The question is, does a working woman contribute to the productivity of a family? The question is a brilliant question and the answer is yes, a working woman does contribute towards the uh, productivity of her family. Uh, in fact, she needs to be able to balance the roles between uh, her workplace and her home. It is much more challenging for a, for a working class mother, for a mother who is working, to be fulfilling both roles, the role of a mother which is of prime importance and the role of a person who is working, perhaps for whatever reason they are working, you know, you have so many responsibilities there. In whatever way you can reach out to your children, some of us who might be here, our children may be in far off lands. They may not be able to be joining us. How do you reach out to them? Do you Skype with them? Do you use the facilities at your disposal to be of maximum benefit to them? So the question you need to ask yourself as a mother is, have I used everything at my disposal to be able to have given my children what my duty is to give to them? So sometimes you have people looking after your children at home because you're working. But when you come back, you need to compensate it in, an, in some way or other. You need to make sure they still have the link with you. You need to make sure you've played that motherly role in their lives. So like I say, you definitely do have that role to play. You will play it by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as best as you can. And you know, if we follow the other rules of productivity, cutting out laziness and so on, uh, being dedicated, being focused, uh, wanting to achieve then by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will be able to succeed in both at our workplace and in the home. Like I say, we need to rise to the challenges of both and we need to face them and try our best inshallah to achieve. Jazakumullahu khaira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum. Um, my question is related to the talk. Your name? My name is Hisham Jaffa. I'm Barakala a student in grade 12. Um, you spoke about discipline throughout your talk and how it's very important to discipline yourself. And daily in our daily life, we make lots of decisions. And in the Quran, Allah says, that the love for desire has been beautified for us. So when we come to make a decision between something we desire, but it's not very productive, and something that is more productive, we incline towards the unproductive one. How do you develop a resolve to fight against yourself? To defeat your own desire and that to is do a, the right thing. Jazakallah khair. What a brilliant question and it is pertinent and it is something that affects so many people by the will of Allah. All of us have challenges. There are so many beautifications of the dunya. As correctly you mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so Islam has given us a package. That package comes more so holistically. When you understand the entire package, it makes it very easy to be able to be productive in a good way and make the correct decisions. I'd like to think as a young man like yourself growing up, if you make sure your company is beautiful, choose company from people whom you think are similar to what you would like to be or they have similar goals in life 
And in that particular case, you will find it becoming so easy for you to make the right decisions. But when you mix with people who have so many different thoughts and ideas that are heading in the wrong direction, it becomes easier for you to make those wrong decisions. And this is why the Islam gives importance to the right company. And that importance is underscored in the Quran and in the in, in, in the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the degree that every one of us, we would benefit from the positive and, uh, company that we have without us realizing we've actually benefited. I give you a simple example. It's not easy to go for salah. My brother, not when you're enjoying a good burger from one of these Burger Kings and so on. You know, uh, maybe I shouldn't mention the name Burger King because I myself would probably pre pre prefer something else. But to be honest with you, Whatever it is, you're enjoying a good meal, you're having a bit of fun at the ice rink, and you're doing this, and come time for salah. If all your friends with you are concerned with, uh, with the same concern, it becomes easy for you to read salah. Five of them will get up and say, guys, there's the corner, we've already organized everything done, come, Allahu Akbar, you there. But if none of them are bothered about salah, and you're the only one in your heart, you say, hey, you know what? We were told to be productive, and salah is the cornerstone of productivity. And I want to be, but your friends say, come on, we're young, man. We read later on, you know, there's something called qada, don't you know? Well, I've heard youngsters say, well, there's qada, it's not bad. Qada is bad. Bad meaning to leave your salah to become qada is bad. It's a sin. Not to do your qada is an even bigger sin, but to leave it to become qada is something, it's a discussion on its own. So if you have good company, it facilitates making your own decision. Inna shaytana ma'al wahid wa huwa min al abad. Shaytan is closer to you individually. You know, when you're alone and you're moving somewhere, it's easier for you to just divert to sin and so on. But when you're four or five guys and you're all good people, it's hard for you to actually, even if you want to look at something, you just say, hey, astaghfirullah, let me look down. One of the brothers told me about astaghfirullah today. Let's leave that inshallah for another time. So I hope and pray that we can have this holistic approach uh, to resolving our problems because if we have bad company and we're not bothered about the other rules of Islam, it's not going to be easy to just follow a few that we, we'd like to. You know, to be able to stay away from uh, that which is haram uh, becomes a little bit more difficult because we have not taken the whole picture. Like a person who doesn't read salah at all, then they're making dua, Ya Allah, you know, keep me away from sin. But Allah says, you fulfill your salah, give it utmost importance. It will automatically make you productive in a way that you abstain from sin. Sin is very counterproductive. It actually comes up with a lot of baggage. May Allah protect us from it. Jazakallah khair, my beloved son. Inshallah, we have uh, one question coming uh, from Norway. Uh, Sister Maryam asks, how can a woman be more productive in pleasing Allah while being at home? My sister, mashallah, productivity at home. Look, you are so productive that you've asked us a question thousands of kilometers away. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you uh, and may he use you to be uh, a means of light for so many others. Sometimes sisters are sitting at home. They have chosen to be, you know, fulfilling the duties at home. They have so much at their disposal. Ask yourself, you know, there are two, three things. If you prefer to use the internet correctly, you may do so, you may become one of the most productive people. Some of the sisters use the internet for da'wah purposes or for spreading any form of goodness in such a big way that you would not believe she's just sitting in one corner in her room and she's reaching out positively to the rest of the world. You won't believe it. Why? Because that's productivity. And sometimes you have sisters who don't have that access because like I say, take a look at what you have at your disposal. So they will gather a few of their friends. They will talk to them in a productive manner. They will try and, you know, be of benefit. Even if you have a cooking lesson, it's productive. Do you know that? Some people think, oh, when you talk of a productive Muslim, it's only to do with Quran. You must learn the Quran and learn the Sunnah and learn the Fiqh and learn the Aqidah and learn the Sharia. And that's a productive Muslim. No. Even if you've reached out to people with your expertise in terms of whatever Allah has blessed you with of this, the knowledge of the world, it is being productive. But each one needs to ask herself and the brothers as well. What are the facilities that Allah has blessed me with? What capacity do I have? What resources do I have? And how am I using them to reach out to the maximum? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, my sister. And I, I do know that you're trying to use whatever you have at your disposal in the right direction because you've reached out to us this evening. And we appreciate that. And we ask Allah to bless you and to bless all the others and to bless us as well. Ameen. Jazakumullah khair.
question from the mic from the brothers. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Mufti. Uh, Jazakallah khair for the uh, session. I'm Jazreen Jamal. I'm a software engineer by profession. Uh, I hope this is not off topic, but uh, since you mentioned uh, about the seerah, how, th how important the seerah is for being a productive Muslim, uh, it would be great if you can summarize a day in the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu life so that we can right away follow it from day one, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. My beloved brother, the brothers asked me to summarize a day in the life of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The truth is, by the will of Allah, I will and the benefit to you by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I will make it a topic of discussion in one of my upcoming talks, inshallah. And then your productivity will reach that particular talk by the will of Allah, and we will all be able to benefit from it. It's a very good subject, and I think I appreciate and I thank you for raising it to say, let's hear, you know, a typical day in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Perhaps th there were different uh, times of his life. We can take a few of these days and inshallah present them uh, as a talk of this nature within an hour so that people can listen to it beautifully and perhaps be able to benefit from it. Shukran, I really appreciate it because productivity includes taking advice from people, listening to what they have to say and appreciating goodness, perhaps adopting it, working towards it. Someone has a bright idea. Productivity is seize it, make the most of it, get it. So I ask Allah to make me from those who's accepted as well and thanks go to you after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shukran, thank you my brother. The sisters from the mic. How can a wife motivate her husband to be a productive husband and father? How to motivate a husband to be a productive husband and a father? My sister, it also goes to do with your choice of a husband before you got married. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and may he grant us goodness. My beloved brothers and sisters, a lot of us, uh, we let down our spouses by being people who uh, hold them back from their productivity just because we are not productive. Look at the complaint of the sister. Let's look at it as a complaint. I know it's just a question and mashallah the sister is well intended. Perhaps it's asking, you know, for the benefit of everyone. But let's take a look at a complaint to say, my dear men, we can be more productive in the home. We can become an asset. You know, some of our wives have a much greater capacity than we do to, to produce goods you know, to do things in their, in, an, in their own way, in a certain sphere of life. Let them excel in that. Don't block it. Don't stop it. For as long as it is beneficial and it does not contradict what Allah has sent down, let it go. Let it happen. Productivity of the women folk from the time of Rasulullah has been such that we have learned a great deal from them and we have benefited so much. So become motivated. Become happy. When your spouse, your family members would like to achieve, don't be a means of their destruction. You know, one of the biggest points of, uh, can I say, counterproductivity is when a child or a spouse wants to obey the laws of Allah and their own family member happens to discourage them to say, no, you're too young to put on the scarf or, you know, you're still too young to read your salah. Why are you waking him up for fajr? Let him sleep and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people who can complement one another and who can be of benefit to one another. My brothers, inshallah, we need to do a lot. The sisters, inshallah, you would obviously have to sit and have a chat, a heart to heart with your own husband and be able to explain to them how important it is to make use of every minute that ticks because the minute that ticks, the second that ticks never comes back. How you used it is written and gone. May Allah bless us all. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is uh, Muhammad. I'm sorry, Khan. I'll stop you there. Just a, a second. We have uh, many questions actually coming on from uh, online. We have one from Sister Aisha from Canada. She says, how can we be a productive, as productive as a family when my four kids and I are here in Canada and my husband works far away from home in the UAE? That's a brilliant question, but I, I have to reply with a similar response to say you have to make the most of your situation. And if, if the situation is really bad, try and do something to change it in the sense that try and, become, try and get physically closer to your spouse. Perhaps do something to achieve that. And if you cannot because, you know, the worldly life has taken, has drifted you apart, some people need to earn, they don't have jobs, they found a job very far away, maybe the children need to go to school so they're separated because of that. You need to make the most of your situation. 
You know, for us to complain all the time is very counterproductive. But to us to, for us to look for solutions and to look for ways of how to make the most of what is at my disposal is what we've been talking about all night tonight. To say, make the most of your situation. If you're far away, you've got your children and so on, the environment might be a very testing, trying environment. Well, make the most of it and try and fulfill the roles of both mother and father and constantly try and engage your spouse, whether it is through Skype or through all the other means that we have now. It's become quite easy. There are so many platforms to talk to the children on a regular basis and to try and follow up and so on. And to create that interest, my beloved uh, sister, we thank you for that. Jazakumullahu khair. As-salamu alaykum. Uh, my name is Muhammad Fahad Ali. And actually the question I have is, uh, how do we convince our elder family members in regards to them being more productive? Because usually when you speak to them, uh, you know, the answer that you get is you're younger than us, you know, so we know better. And, you know, like for, uh, for you to tell us anything, you know, you know, it has to be like from someone who's older than us. So how do you convince someone who is, uh, you know, your elder family member uh, in terms of being productive in Islamic way as well as everyday life? Jazakumullah khair. Brilliant. We do have a little bit of an obstacle that I touched on in my talk where the younger generation sometimes have the energy and the oldies are just sitting back and not facilitating things for them, not even allowing them to do it on their own to say, no, don't do it and so on. But you mentioned a solution in your question. Because he, they would say, we need someone elder than us or more respected than us to tell us. Well, bring them. Bring someone elder, bring someone more respected, perhaps in the form of a disc or a DVD or a YouTube link or something. Turn it on and say, dad or granddad or whoever, I just want you to listen to this for two minutes. And the height of productivity and the advice that is given to utilize resources to be as productive as possible, let them sit and listen to it and then just smile and say, is this person not uh, someone who you would uh, you know, consider more than me? Because that's the problem. Like you say, they would want to hear it from authority, from someone they would look up to. Well, bring that person. It's not impossible. But when we start losing our own uh, hope in our own productivity, we just give up and say, ah, you know, I want to be productive, but there's my dad. He's very counterproductive. Well, you can do things to make him think otherwise. But those solutions need to come from you based on your situation. Everyone's situation will be different. Sometimes you might have to bring the Imam from the masjid to literally come and talk to them. Sometimes if they really respect someone, get the man's phone number, get some. I have happened sometimes, just coincidentally, to be contacted by some people and they want me to talk to this one or that one for two minutes. If it is convenient, sometimes it does happen. And I phone certain people just to talk to them, perhaps on a different issue altogether. But it can happen. You can get hold of someone from across the globe to do something. Like someone says, well, if that man tells me, I listen. So my, inshallah, my goal is I'm going to bring that man to tell it to you. Then will you listen? Okay, write it down for me and sign it here. MashaAllah. May Allah grant us goodness. May Allah open our doors. Jazakallah khair. But a quick point of advice also is for us who are a little bit older here, please allow your children, your grandchildren and the others to use their capacity to be productive in a positive way. Because if we don't allow them to use their energies productively, one of two things will happen. Either they will use it counterproductive or destructively, or either they will waste their time becoming lazy, which, which is something that will make them lose confidence in themselves and they begin to feel that I cannot achieve. Why? Because the older people always put them down and made them feel you cannot achieve. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. We'll take a question from the sisters. How can you be a productive Muslim to your non-Muslim family, especially when you are away from them? Subhanallah, that's a very beautiful question. How can we be productive to our non-Muslim family when we are away from them? Uh, I believe that when a person has accepted Islam, reverted to Islam, and they have non-Muslim family, it is their duty to be very patient, to display the best of character and conduct and to reach out beautifully and constantly in a lovely way to your family. So if you send them a monthly stipend, perhaps increase it a little bit. If people send money back home, increase it a bit. I'm a Muslim, so online. we were taught to be more charitable to our family because you, you have now 
shown them that you've become a better person. A lot of people think that, oh, they've become a Muslim. They're probably rotten people, not realizing that it's actually the other way around. They've become better people. So when you phone, you speak to your mom and so on, and you speak to them like you're so happy and you should be. Oh, my mom, I'm so delighted to talk to you. I just wanted to hear your voice. I'm so happy. You don't know how much I was missing you and so on. These type of words are very productive. You don't understand the value and the impact of these words that really need to come out of our mouth. So the answer to that would be, we need to reach out to them more. We need to be kinder to them, more kind. We need to be more polite. We need to uh, be more in touch with them. And don't debate and argue, no. Try not to get into argument, debate, and you know, discussion that makes them feel very, if, if they say, for example, that you know, I'm very upset with what you did and so on, tell them, you know, keep on praying. Allahu Akbar, that's a good answer. Pray for me. Even though you know that, you know, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it's a way of pacifying them to say, I don't want to argue with you, you know. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. Uh, really, it is so important that your interaction with your non-Muslim family will either make them come closer to Islam or go further away. So if your bad habits have gone and they know that you no longer smoke, you no longer drink, you no longer visit the clubs, you're no longer a person who is terrible or bad and so in, in so many ways, you no longer waste your money and so on, because you're a Muslim, deep down, they will be inclined towards Islam. If Allah has written guidance for them, they will even enter the fold. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use us to spread good. Amen. Inshallah. We have a brother, Abu Hafsa, from UK. He asks, how can we train our children to be more productive and to encourage it? Uh, these questions are all interconnected if you think of it, because children, a lot of the times, would be mimicking their parents. They mimic the adults. So if they watch you and they see you, they will do what you do. If you show an importance to, for example, a talk of this nature, you're very excited and you show the importance, the children become excited with you. I'm sure a lot of us in our homes, we've brought our little children along because they're also excited. I also want to come. Dad, I want to come. Yes, 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 I know. You show the excitement of watching something on YouTube, which is good. They will show the excitement with you. You know, they see dad is so happy and it's something good. Not happy after he's committed a sin and then he's separated himself from his family and then his children hardly see him and then when his wife questions him, he becomes angry and that's what the children are watching and so on. That is very, very destructive. That is something that can destroy us. You want to develop your children? Allah has placed something so simple in them and that is their automatic respect for you such that whatever you do, they will automatically want to mimic it. So dress appropriately, show the importance of salah, how you speak and so on. We touched on a few of these pointers and inshallah in that way we will be able to nurture them in a way to use or to make the maximum use of whatever their gifts are. Also, uh, what is important is whatever your child is inclined towards, whatever he likes a lot, if it is something good and he has the energy, the capacity to do that, Try and modify, motiv you know, modify it and motivate him to use that energy. Enhance it in a way that will not be displeasing to Allah. Some people, are, some children are expert, for example, in little computers and gadgets. Well, let them excel in that field by the will of Allah. You, know, don't, you don't have to block it. And perhaps guide them how to benefit Islam in the process also a little bit and that brings me to another point which might not be directly connected to the question But since it's come to my mind, I'm going to mention it in any field that we have all of us We need to utilize that workplace of ours To serve the Deen even if it is in the smallest way possible At my workplace, how did I present my Deen? The profession I have, how did I present my deen? Something extremely important, inshallah. Jazakallah khair for that question regarding children. And I hope we can actually share ideas. That's also very important with one another by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. Inshallah, we see a lot of expectation here on the questions, but inshallah, we're about closing. So we're going to take two last questions, one from the brothers and one from the sister. 
um, on the mic. The brother may take the first question. Just before we take the next question, part of productivity was that you got up to ask the question. That was so productive. So just with that, we say, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. I know some might have to sit down and so on uh, because of the time factor. But you, the questions you have, get them answered, inshallah. Get them answered either by email or by someone who might be, you know, more knowledgeable. Uh, perhaps, inshallah, like I said, Abu Productive, inshallah, there's a whole site dedicated to it. Go and search for it and inshallah, you will be able to get a lot of answers from there. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my... Okay. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. My Sorry. name is Sani Hashmi and I'm a banker by profession. Well, not proud of it, but it's a different topic altogether. Um, the, the actual question is, the workload is about 11 to 12 hours a day. So um, I don't find time for my family, let alone myself. I, know, I need to know a productive way of how to divide my time between work, family, and at the same time create a productive uh, cell development uh, routine for a daily life. Brilliant. My brother, your working hours seem to be 11 to 12 hours, okay? Perhaps going to work, coming back, it might be a time. So you don't get much time during the week. What about the weekend? Do you not get a little bit of time? You do? Yeah. So if you get a bit of time during the weekend for your family, maximize the use of the weekend for the family. The problem with us, we work 12 hours, we've hardly seen our children come weekend and we're out with our friends. So what happened? Productivity is to know how to prioritize. It's part of productivity. If I don't know how to prioritize and I give priority to friends every weekend over my family, I will lose that which is more important because then my wife is like a widow, but she's married. So she's hanging neither married nor, nor not married because I'm hardly ever there. And what about me? My children have a father, but they're like orphans. We spoke about it this morning. To be honest, you need to make sure of that time. Number one. Number two is set yourself a deadline to say, I'm going to work like this for 10 years, for five years. And after that, I'm going to cut my hours of work somehow. I'm going to get a new job. And, and so eye it out from the beginning to say, by the will of Allah, it's not possible for everyone, but for a lot of people, they can adjust their work hours after a certain period of time. I always tell people, if you've been working from six to six every single day for your whole life, if you've had an opportunity to cut it down to seven to five and you haven't, then you've done a great disservice to your own family. So inshallah, look out for those opportunities and let's hope that Allah grants uh, that to us. You have to make the most of whatever's there. Maybe you might have to cut your sleeping by half an hour in order to enjoy a little breakfast with your children because one of the most productive things you can serve for your family is to have a meal with them together. Very productive. Sit with your children and your family. Your, you know, we're talking of mahram here. Sit with your children, your family, and you know, the table manners, the discussion on the table. Beautiful. They mustn't, you must not have a Tom and Jerry relationship with your children. Because if that's the case, you know, you're not going to achieve anything. But beautiful relation, say good words and so on. That little meal, whether it's breakfast, supper, or you know, dinner, whatever it is, is very, very important. One meal a day, even if it is a snack after you arrive. So we ask Allah to help us make the most of whatever we have at our disposal by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shukran, my brother. Uh, how does a slang seem to be unproductive uh, since uh, you mentioned it in your talk? Uh, as in some cultures, slang is the means of connecting and communicating better. This is a question. Sorry, my sister, I, I, I cannot really hear so clearly. If you can just speak yeah. up or perhaps yes. they can raise the volume slightly. Um, how does a slang, because you mentioned in your talk about slang not to use and it's unproductive. Yes. Yes. So this sister seems to be a teacher by profession and she puts up the question saying, how does a slang seem to be unproductive as in some cultures, slang is the means of connecting and communicating better. Jazakumullah khair and I appreciate it because there is a small addition that I needed to make, which I'm going to make now. When we talk of slang, we're talking of that which is dirty and that which is incorrect, that which is, uh, you know, cheap language. We're not talking of perhaps shortcut, you know, which gallak, you know, which gallak is slang, but it's proper language. You know, the children will tell you that's Arabic. It means what did he tell you, you know? So to be honest with you, it's still better for us to be able to, to, to say it properly, but some of it is considered a norm. It's considered clean. Ask yourself, would I like my children to speak the way I speak? If the answer is yes, bismillah. If the answer is no, modify your speech. So when we say slang, people have 
uh, dirty words that they add into so much of their speech in order uh, to just beautify the language because of their friends. Not realizing it's not beautified, it's actually made so ugly and dirty because these words are dirty. It's not just a slang that is used uh, in a respectful way, but it's in a dirty way. So the, the, the teacher is very, very correct when uh, she asks the question to say, that, you know, what if the slang is the general language that we speak? In that sense, inshallah, uh, the addition that I've made would clarify it. And I thank you for giving me the opportunity to make that little clarification. Jazakumullahu khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Just before we do the conclusion of the program here, we I'd like to call upon Brother Zakaria from the management of Al Manar Center to, inshallah, give the word of thanks. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear brothers and sisters, Jazakallah khair for being with us this beautiful evening. And we thank on behalf of Al Manar, Mufti Ismail Mink, taking too much trouble to come here to Dubai. And full day, he was giving the advices for the goodness of our family. May Allah reward you in this world and world hereafter. Wa akhir dawana. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen.